As we begin our fourth year programming here at the Med Center, I'd like to take a moment to express once again my sincere appreciation to our distinguished 1950 alumnus, Roger Mudd, whose generous gift has made all of this possible. Without Roger's vision of creating a center on campus that would support and encourage the study of public and professional ethics, none of us would be sitting here today. I would also like to thank Director Mark Rush and the Center for International Education for their help in co-sponsoring today's event. Today's lecture is the keynote address for this year's Mud Center series on the topic of equality and difference. This seems like a particularly relevant topic for us to explore at this time in our history, as we seem to be witnessing deep and growing divisions, both in this country and around the world, over the nature, meaning, and value of equality and its relation to issues of individual and group difference. Over the course of this year, we hope to address a question, questions such as the following. What exactly does it mean to treat one another as equals in economic, social, legal, or political life? Does treating people as equals always require treating people equally? Or might it sometimes require differential treatment? Are there inherent tensions between ideals of equality and ideals of respect for individual difference? And are there tensions between ideals of equality and ideals of justice? I've placed some brochures in the back that list the upcoming lectures in the series, and I encourage you to visit our Mud Center webpage for more information about each of these events. In light of our topic this year, I am particularly delighted to have an opportunity to introduce this year's Mud Distinguished Lecturer in Ethics, Professor Tarek Ramadan. I just have to say, for those of you who may not be aware of Dr. Ramadan's extensive international following, that our Mud Center announcements have received more views on Twitter and Facebook over the last week than we have had combined in our four years of existence. <laughs> Over 85,000 people have seen our social media posts in the last few days, and I hope many of them are watching us today via live stream. Uh, and actually, Tarek just posted the link to the live stream, and he has two million followers, so we're going to get a lot of attention here, I think. This alone should give you some indication of Dr. Ramadan's status as one of the most important public intellectuals in the world today. Yet this status has not come without controversy. As Dr. Ramadan himself notes in his 2010 book, What I Believe, he has come to be known as a controversial intellectual. As a reformist Muslim scholar, he has sought to build bridges between what he calls two universes of reference. That is, between two highly debatable constructions termed Western civilization and Islamic civilization, and between citizens within Western societies themselves. He has engaged in a comprehensive reappraisal of the sources of Islam with the explicit aim of helping Muslims to feel comfortable both with their affiliation to Islam and with their identity as full-fledged citizens of Western and European societies. He has also called upon non-Muslim majorities in Western societies to recognize their Muslim neighbors as citizens with rights and responsibilities, the same as everyone, and as full participants in the democratic life of the societies in which they live. This attempt to speak to multiple audiences at once, remaining faithful to the principles of Islam on the basis of scriptural sources but also taking into account the evolution of historical and geographical contexts has ensured that Dr. Ramadan's views have been a target of intense and ongoing controversy. It is for this reason, among others, that he seemed to be an ideal speaker to kick off this year's series on equality and difference. One of the fundamental challenges we face in the world today is to learn how to speak and how to listen respectfully to one another, 
even when, or perhaps especially when, we are coming to our dialogue from two radically different universes of discourse. As someone who has grappled with this interpretive challenge throughout his scholarly career, Dr. Ramadan is perhaps uniquely situated to help us to think through what a true commitment to both equality and respect for difference might look like. Dr. Ramadan is currently the H. H. Sheikh Hamid bin Khalifa Al Thani Professor of Contemporary Islamic Studies at the University of Oxford, St. Anthony's College. He is also a senior research fellow at the Doshisha University in Kyoto, Japan, and is the director of the Research Center of Islamic Education and Ethics in Doha, Qatar. He holds an MA in philosophy and French literature and a PhD in Arabic and Islamic studies from the University of Geneva. He also studied at Al-Azhar University in Cairo, where he underwent 20 months of intensive tutoring in classical Islamic studies and Islamic law. He has written over 30 scholarly books in both French and English, including titles such as the following, Islamic Ethics, a very short introduction, Islam in the Arab Awakening, The Quest for Meaning, Developing a Philosophy of Pluralism, Radical Reform, Islamic Ethics and Liberation, and To Be a European Muslim. His most recent book, Introduction to Islam, has just been published by Oxford University Press, and we've actually placed some flyers in the back that offer a discount code uh, from Oxford if you would like to order his new book online. In addition to his work as a scholar and teacher, Dr. Ramadan is the current president of the European Muslim Network and is a member of the International Union of Muslim Scholars. He has been listed by Foreign Policy Magazine as one of the 100 most influential intellectuals in the world today four times, and in 2004 he was listed by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. Dr. Ramadan currently travels around the world giving lectures to a variety of audiences, and he is active at both academic and grassroots levels. We are very, very fortunate to have Professor Ramadan with us here today. His lecture is entitled, Equality as a Social Requirement and a Human Ideal. Please join me in giving him a very warm welcome to Washington and Lee. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor uh, Smith, for first your invitation, this kind introduction. Um, I'm very happy to be here. It's been a long time when we started talking about the potential uh, presence, and I'm very happy to be able to, to talk about such a topic which is essential in our understanding. So let me start uh, uh, with a, uh, an introduction to my introduction. Uh, my main point when you were talking about my travelings around the world, and I think that this topic, when it comes to equality and as a social requirement, when it comes to our understanding of our common humanity, I think what is essential and what is important for us is not only to look at it on, through a, a theoretical framework. Philosophy is important, religion is important, our ideas are, are important, but the question here, and especially talking here in this uh, uh, region of the world, is how do we translate this into uh, a social and civic commitment? The way we are dealing, my understanding of philosophy and my understanding of any academic work is in which we are serving our societies, our serving, our way of dealing with uh, issues and how we are going to struggle for more equality and more justice within our society. So it's much more a call for us coming together and trying to understand how we can translate this than just a theoretical discussion about some very nice views that are not going to have any impact on reality. So this is the introduction to my introduction. Now my introduction, what I have is five main points just to start our discussion this evening. As you know, can you hear me at the back? It's just okay? Yes? It's fine? Because it's, it's not. Okay. 
That's better? Is it better like that? Can you hear me? Not really? That's now it's okay. okay. So, um, as you know, the notion of equality is a contested notion. Whatever uh, is your take on this, when you enter the field of philosophy or religion or, or history of thought, equality is a disputed concept, uh, contested uh, definitions, and uh, uh, we are not agreeing, and depending on how we are dealing with it, uh, it's a, a difficult task just to try to understand what we are talking about. Because when we speak about equality, you have this first step is to say, be careful, we speak about equality, it's not identity, and identity should not be confused with sameness, so we can be not identical, but still we have to be equal. So I haven't even started the discussion that it's already complex. It's already problematic, and we have problematized this, and it's very important to get a sense that it's not an easy concept. Because uh, 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 when it comes to uh, uh, try to understand what we are talking about, it's important. You have the formal uh, equality, but you have the proportional equality. You have uh, uh, the reality of what is normative and what is moral equality, and in which way we have to deal with this, uh, uh, when it comes also to the legal reference. So the starting point of our discussion is not for me to have, in 45 minutes, I cannot go through all this, and I, I, that's not my goal. My goal is not to problematize to the point that it's so complex that at the end we are uh, uh, helpless, we cannot do any, anything with the notion itself. But not to simplify, it's important and to be uh, uh, able to be efficient in the way we deal with equality doesn't mean that we have to be simplistic in the way we are dealing with notions and philosophical notions and religious notions and social notions that are important. Now, there is a second point which is important and it is, is the way it's connected in the first part of my, uh, uh, the title of my, my, my uh, lecture is the relationship between equality and justice. And that's a very important point in our discussion because uh, what we know when it comes to uh, uh, equality is the, the formal dimension of justice, which is coming from a very old tradition, the Greek tradition, Aristotle, uh, uh, telling us that we have to treat like cases as like, which is the, the, the essential starting point of our discussion on equality and, and justice, and saying what is going to be the parameter of dealing uh, with like cases as like is our common rationality. So we have to come to our rationality to be able to deal with the formal justice, which once again is could be problematic when you come from or uh, you are belonging to spiritual tradition, religious tradition, is how do you deal with rationality? Is, the, is it possible with your religion and with your spiritual reference to come to a common rationality without undermining your religious reference? Is your religious reference by definition undermining our common rationality, yes or no? Which is the starting point of a deep question, and especially when we are in pluralistic societies as we are today. In the United States of America, this is the reality of a pluralistic society. What is going to be our parameter, our, our, uh, the, the reference on which we are going to rely to come together? So that's something which is important. And then you also have, from the formal uh, way of dealing with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, um, equality and justice, uh, the proportional dimension, which is also something which is quite interesting, and, and you, I will come to this in my discussion, because the, 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 the normative and uh, the formal one, uh, could you can be just in a formal way and in just in the way you are going to implement the formal way of being just with the people, because you need to get a sense of you can't be just and you can't treat the people equally if you disconnect them or you separate them from the environment within which they are living. So you have to take into account the context and you have to take it into account the, the, the status within the context, which is part of uh, 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 the discussion and what is uh, uh, due to the people in a specific context. So once again, when it comes to try to deal with justice, you see that justice is as complex as equality when it comes to the theoretical way of dealing with notions like this one. 
There is a third dimension which, on which we, very quickly, when we want to be very simple and sometimes simplistic in the way we deal with the notion of equality and, and the notion of uh, justice, is something that came to us uh, through uh, the, the uh, Enlightenment, which is what we call moral equality, saying, you know, if you come to great Western philosophers, Hobbes, Rousseau, Kant, <laughs> Uh, uh, these philosophers were agreeing on one thing which is essential for us, which is something that at least theoretically we all agree with, which is we are equal as human beings and we have the same dignity as human beings, period. We, whatever you say about black, white, rich, poor, the starting point of everything on a ra rational basis is we have the same equal dignity as human beings. So this is what we call, and we start, you know, you have this in, in, in the, the very long tradition in the West, uh, coming after the, 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 the Enlightenment, but by, by the way, it's not exactly true. It's something that in philosophy we came to acknowledge. But if you look at uh, uh, the, the monotheistic tradition, the Jewish tradition, the Christian tradition, there is something which has to do with this. And the Islamic tradition is exactly the same. Monotheistic tradition are saying, in the name of our common humanity, we have to treat people exactly with the same dignity. So this is something which is old, but the way it has been translated, it doesn't mean, by the way, that it's an old idea that it was implemented. As you know, all the religions and all the, even the most enlightened philosophy were not treating the people equally. We went to uh, the southern countries to civilize the people in the name of our dignity versus their backwardness and, and, and that we have to civilize the people. So good ideas are not always connected to right policies and right uh, way of dealing with politics in the name, uh, as you know, what we are doing sometimes in the name of human rights is exactly the opposite of anything which has to do with human dignity, an equal human dignity. So, and exactly the same from a religious viewpoint. So I, I would say here that what is important in our discussion is this, uh, uh, this uh, moral equality which is based on a way we deal with our humanity. It's something which is important in our discussion. And I would say that this should be a parameter th through which we look at what is happening in our societies today. Because it's all good to have this understanding of our equal dignity, look at the way we are dealing with our fellow citizens and our fellow human beings. So the point here is that this reference is somewhere, but our way of dealing today at the collective level, at the individual level, is problematic. Uh, in the way we are dealing with such notions, and I will come to this during my talk. And uh, if we agree on this, if we agree on this uh, moral equality and equal dignity of all, there is something that uh, we should not uh, ask. It's, it should be a, a normal answer for us, and still we have to ask the question, is that uh, uh, among whom are we talking about equality? If we agree that this is something which is our humanity and our, us as human beings, we are all equal, do we have to ask the question among whom? Remember, the first democratic society, and we are all referring to this, when you speak about democracy, you speak about the Greek tradition. But the Greek tradition was not democracy for all was democratic rights for some, and the barbarians, all the people who were outside Athens, were not part of the whole thing. So it's all good to speak about equality, but we speak about who are these people that you are referring to when you speak about equality? All the human beings or some? I'm saying this because you might think that I'm speaking about the Greek a very long time ago, and still in our societies in the West, in many societies, we still have to ask this question, among whom? Who are these people? Who are the people that you agree and you accept that it's equal rights, justice, and justice for all? Uh, so saying justice for all should help us to avoid the question of among whom, and still it's there in our way of dealing with our uh, 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 society. 
Uh, now, when it comes to, and this is my last point, and you see that with this introduction, I'm already problematizing all the dimensions of this discussion about equality. Not to make it complex, but to make it clear uh, that it's complex, yes, but we need to deal with this in order to come to efficient answer in our daily life when we are dealing with equality, justice, and humanity. So my last point here is, when it comes to uh, the way we have to deal with uh, the society uh, itself, we have to go from the social requirement, which is the first part of my talk, to the human ideal. And the human ideal, it's uh, really, tell me the way you think about our common humanity. I will understand the way you deal with your society. And not only with your society, your society and the world. It has to do with not only us as American citizens, is us as human beings. And the way sometimes in the name of citizenship we are undermining our belonging to our common humanity. And this is essential today. Uh, when it comes, I will come to this discussion. So uh, um, I think that we have to go from this understanding at, the, at our national level, at our philosophical level, to our common humanity and the way we deal with the world and to deal with equality in the way we deal with our society, but in the way uh, equality in the way we deal with our common humanity. And there is a lot to do in this. Intellectually, emotionally, and politically, we have to be involved much more in our understanding of how do we connect to our common humanity. Because of what is happening today, and emotional politics is not helping us to be rational and wise. We are not dealing with wisdom, not enough wisdom in this. And wisdom means to be rationally courageous. So there is no wisdom without courage. Wisdom to think that you can sit down and wait for it to happen is not going to be this. The best example of wisdom was Socrates, and he was courageous to the point that he accepted to die for his thoughts. I said, I'm going to, okay, I'm going to go as far as this. My consistency with my thought is just to face the injustice of my society. So wisdom has to do also with courage. Now, having said that, let me start with the first part, and I will try to stick to my time because I think it's important to have questions and answers at the end and, and to be able to share uh, some discussion. Let me start with the first dimension, which is the first part of the talk, which is uh, equality as a social requirement. And here, what we would say, which is essential, and it's very simple, we agree that in a democratic society, the starting point and the reference of a democratic society is rule of law. Rule of law means every single human being, and most importantly in a structured society, all the citizens should be treated equally by the law. So that's something which is written everywhere. The American Constitution, so many Western constitutions, even in African countries, we have this written, and it's clear. We are all equal before law, and this is uh, something which is acknowledging the fact that when I'm saying that you are equal, and I'm saying that you have the same rights as my rights, I don't rely on your gender, I don't have to deal with your class, I'm not concerned with your color, and I don't care about your origin. You are a human being, you are a citizen, you should be treated equally by law. That's all fine, but it's never like this. Never. Why? Because there is something which is important is that the legal framework is essential to get this equal treatment, but it's not enough. Why? Because there is one first question, which is essential in our way of dealing with social justice as a social requirement, is to ask one simple question. That's all fine that we are referring to the law. Now tell me, who is reading and implementing the law? Because not only it's important to have the law, but it's also a question of who has the power to read and to implement. And here comes the first question that you can't just say rule of law it's enough you have to 
challenge and to question who has the authority. Because at the end, law is there to master and control our power relationship. It's just to make it possible for us to be, to have a legal system helping us to be treated on an equal footing. Yet, the law are not enough and they are not preventing us from a power relationship in the way, the, who, in the, in the way they are going to be read and implemented. And on this, you can just rely on the state or rely on the lawyer. There are economic factors and there are four main references that you have to take into account. And as you know, this is one of the most important claims that you have today, and it has been a long history in, uh, in the United States of America, but also in uh, the Western countries, and in every single country you'll find exactly the same. What is the first dimension when we have to challenge the reading of the law? It's the class reality. And I know that we don't like to talk about this, but there is a relationship, a class relationship, is that you have poor people and rich people. And the way the rich are going to read the law, it's not the way the poor people are going to read the law. It's simple and essential at the same time. So this power relationship based on social economic status within the society is critical. You can have the best law, depending on who is reading the law, if it's the rich people, they are going to implement the law. And this is exactly what was said by the poor or the uh, uh, marginalized societies and classes within this society saying, in fact, you are talking about equality, but we don't see it. When, for example, when I came the first time, my first encounter with the United States of America was mainly with the African-American community. And the African-American community was saying something which is, imp which is essential. We have been here for 500 years and more. Don't speak to us as if we were foreigners. We are citizens. The problem is not to be citizens or not. The problem is the way we are treated as citizens. And you can have the same right by law and still treated as a second-class citizen because of the discrimination that you are facing every day. So, the legal system is not preventing from this uh, reality within the society. So, as you know, the four dimension, it's a uh, uh, class, it's uh, something which is essential. Race and color, it's important. No way to deal with the United States of America without dealing with whiteness and, and, and blackness and the white supremacist and, and what you have now with Black Lives Matter telling you you have to deal with it. There is something which is rooted in the history of this country, which has to do with we were very nice in speaking about equality, not so nice in implementing the reality of equality in the way we were dealing with poor people, black people, Latinos today, they are facing discriminations. Uh, that's also something which is essential. We have to take it as it is. Add to this gender equality. Because the great majority of the people who are reading the law are male. That's the reality. That's the reality and then it comes to something which is in the name of law because we are hiding before, behind what? Which type of logic? Equality, it's not sameness. And a woman, it's not a man. That's fine. But in the name of this, you can justify everything by trying to explain, and I will come to this, the religious discourse was very quick to say, you are not the same, so it's not social equality, social complementarity, which is problematic in itself. But the point here is, that's fine, but because there is a different, we, we are not identical, we should still be treated equally, and there is something which is still, there is a, still a lot to do, which is, how is it? that for the same skills, we don't have the same salary. How can we justify this? Instead of speaking about the way the people dress, just speak about the essential justice, which is same skills, same salary. 
And it's, you can't justify the, in the name of, it's not sameness, it's not identical, that you can justify injustice when it comes to something which is as essential as salary. And salary is not only something which has to do with money, it's your financial independence and autonomy and acknowledgement that you are part of the job market as an, an, an autonomous agent. It's essential here. But as you see, depending on who is reading the law, you are justifying injustice and unjust treatment uh, while the law is talking about equality. And you can see here that from the social, it has to do with the economic reality, the economic uh, sphere. So now, this is the first step when it comes to our understanding of uh, uh, um, uh, the, the, the four dimension, which is uh, the cl class, ethnicity, race or color, which is part of it. And, and I'm also talking about color because color matters. It's not only just, you know, ethnicity and race, color. Color matters. And if you notice, it's just when you walk in the street, color matters. There's something here which has to do with an equal perception. In itself, the way you look at the people, the way you can think of somebody who is suspicious. And by the way, the starting point of what we call today Islamophobia is visibility. It's the visible perception. But it's exactly the same with black people in our country here. The visible presence is perceived as problematic and you can deal with the law differently depending on how you look at people. Which, once again here, is something that has to do with our psychology and our common narrative. Now, having said this, as part of this discussion, uh, you have, as I said, class, ethnicity, gender. Uh, these three dimensions could also be added, and sometimes it's what uh, uh, Kimberly uh, Krisha was talking about when he, she was talking about cumulative processes of intersectionality. And intersectionality is added factor that are in fact creating a sense of a, a, a reality of complete injustice and equality as to the treatment within the society. So we can have once again a very clear understanding that when we speak about equality, we speak about justice. When we speak about justice, we speak about the legal framework. It's enough to have a, a clear legal framework talking about equality. That's not at all the case. That's not, we have to talk about power struggle, who has the power to read, who has the power to implement, and who has the political and even the cultural power when it comes to this translation. And yes, in the United States of America, as well as in European countries, or in other countries, we will have the same, the, the common narrative, the way we look at, at the cultural capital, to speak like Bourdieu, is something which is uh, essential. Now, having said this, let me come to a second point, which has to do with specifically with gender. And here we have a problem. We have a problem because it's not solved. Of course, we have a process here which has it, an ongoing process of real equality in the way we have to be uh, dealing with. And this is where uh, we, we might have a problem, and we have a problem with the religious discourse when it comes to this. And this is why you were talking about the way I'm trying from within to uh, uh, reassess the religious discourse. And when we speak about religious discourse within the public sphere, willing it or not, you may hope that one day there will be no religious voices within, the, within the, the public. It's not going to happen. Religion is there and it's going to stay. So spiritual voices, uh, religious voices, it is agnostic. We have to come together. Now, it's very important to take seriously this question of gender within the society. And once again, who is talking and from where? So you can speak from the legal and once again, as I told you, there is a problem in the way we are implementing. But there is something which is even deeper than that, is the discussion that we have in gender about the, 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 our understanding of beings that are not identical, there is not, they are not the same, and still, as human beings, we, have to, we need to be able to speak about womanhood, manhood, on an equal understanding of the autonomous being. And this discourse, it's difficult to get from religious traditions. 
Because what you have mainly in the religious tradition is to say you are equal before God, a complementary in society. This discourse could lead to things that are completely unjust. At the end of the day, complementary, the master complement the slave. It's a complementary relationship. It's not an equal thing. And some of the great scholars of Islam, that you find this in the Jewish tradition, in the Christian tradition, in the Buddhist tradition, the great scholars, the great spiritual uh, uh, minds were in our respective history justifying a relationship between gender which was not based on equality. And I'm talking about something which is essential. Before talking about equal rights, equality of beings, and the equali this equality of this autonomous being, which is really a discourse on women. The fact that in our tradition, the Islamic tradition, the great majority of the work was, were done by male, very often they were stressing on the women as daughter, as mother, as sister, but not as women. But not as women. So womanhood is, and the liberating process here is something which is also important. If you are struggling for equality, it's important here that the leading, the driving force is also the people who are the first to challenge the status quo. So, so this is where it's important to have women's movement dealing with issues and taking seriously the religious discourse and the social discourse based on this. That's important. I would say not women against men, women and men together in the name of this, the, these principles, but this is something which is part of uh, a discussion which is important. It's not yet done in any of the religious traditions. And as religions are part of our pluralistic societies, we need to take this seriously. It will be very difficult to have a discourse on equality if we don't take seriously the religious voices and to make clear that here there is something to be said from the being as being equal to the salary that should be equal with the same skills. So this is the true liberating process which is important. Now, there is a third point when it comes to equality as a social requirement. And this is where I was telling you it's, it's a deep discussion. When I was talking to African Americans saying, you know, we are citizens and then we need to, to get a sense that other people should get a sense that we are all equal in this society. And as you know, you are not treated equally by law in this country if you are black poor and perceived as suspicious or if you are dealing with the legal system you know that uh, you are five times more likely to go to death, death sentence when you are black and poor than when you are rich and white. That's the reality of this country. There is something which is the law is not saying this but the reality is that when you have money and lawyers that's fine. That's easier. While you are not, and we are suspected, or suspicious, or not perceived as part of the society, or part of the dominant narrative, is something else. So that's my point here, when it comes to the social requirement, when it comes to justice, uh, which is based on to go from the moral, uh, the moral equality that we are talking about to the reality of what is happening now. What we have in our structured community is something which is quite clear. When we speak about equality, among whom? It's among us. So it should be equality among the American citizens, or it should be equality among the uh, European citizens, the German. When we have a structured society within a state, a nation state, we are talking about equality among ourselves. As I said, we have a problem with four main fields when it comes to gender, class, and, and ethnicity, and so on and so forth. But there is another problem, which is even deeper than that. I thought, for example, for decades, and I was writing on this, that at the end, in order to be treated equally within a society, or 
to be perceived as one of us within the society, what you need to get is the passport and the citizenship. So when you are a citizen, you are going to be treated equally. By the way, it's not visible in my face, but I am a Swiss citizen. I'm Swiss. So you might think that, uh, you know, I would have thought that it's enough. And once I was facing a far-right leader, uh, a leader of a far-right party, telling me something that was changing the whole perspective. You, as a Muslim, you are too much a Muslim to be a true citizen. Meaning that what came through the legal was not enough. There is something which is essential, that equality is not only to have the same rights, it's also to belong to the common narrative. The common narrative is the sense of belonging. And that's essential, why? Because Schrinkel, the sociologist, the uh, Dutch sociologist, was saying, you know what is happening in our societies now? What is happening in our societies now that we are adding to the legal citizenship, something which is a moral citizenship. A moral citizenship is the informal. It's not said, but it's everywhere. That in order to be one of us, because we are talking about equality, among us. So you stop, you sit down and say, who is this us that you are talking about? This is why 20 years ago, I launched a call for a new we. A new we, saying, you and me, it's we. Even though you might have thought that we is you. And my understanding is we is we, you and me. I'm not playing with words, it's essential. It's essential because equality is going to have to do with the psychological factor, the collective psychology, the, the dominant narrative, which has to do with the nation and not with the state. The state you deal with the law, but the nation you deal with psychology and the sense of belonging. Am I part of the whole narrative? Am I part of this society? So when, for example, the people who are now struggling to get their rights acknowledged, Latinos in this country who are Americans, black people who are Americans, when they are saying our history coming from slavery to citizenship, if you don't get this as part of what is the American narrative, and you stop talking about the American narrative as something which is the white dominant narrative, whatever our citizenship, we are not getting equality in this country because it's going to be distorted. The way you construct your narrative is not making us part of it. So it's still us and you. It's not the we. It's essential because this is, this is in the unsaid. It's not verbalized. It's not legalized. To get this, you need to deal with our common ethics that we are, you know, the moral equality that I was talking about, and more than this, the historical narrative, which is what is making us and bringing us together. That's essential, and it's happening. It's not new, by the way, and, and, and anything which has to do with populism, anything which has to do with nationalism is playing with this. And we are dealing with this today uh, when it comes to, uh, for example, it's a reality in this country. This is why I have been following, you know, what is happening with, uh, with the movement, the, the rhetoric, the, the, the claim coming from the black people in the United States of America saying it's a question of rights, it's a question of dignity, but it's also a question of narrative. And they are right on this. But it's exactly the same with the new, newcomers, for example, when you listen to Trump speaking about Muslims. I'm sorry, if you listen to him speaking about Muslims and you think that you can be, in his terms, completely Muslims and American, you need to get some imagination just to think it's possible. And if you listen to when the people were confusing 
and saying Barack Obama is a Muslim and say uh, he's a Muslim but he's a good guy meaning implicitly Muslim is bad guy so you can say things like this by the way when Powell Colin Powell was trying to respond to this he say uh, he responded to say how come we are connecting the the fact that you are a Muslim to being alien to the nation and putting an ethical evaluation and assessment who you are as a good and as a bad. Meaning we are the good and, and we still have to check if you are good enough. That's something which is happening with black people, Latinos, and the way we are perceiving uh, the narrative. And, and, and you can't just come and respond by saying, we are going to get equality just by implementing the law. Because this narrative has a direct impact on the way you deal with the law. Because the law are instruments. The legal framework is instruments in the, 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 the hands of the powerful and the people who are creating the whole narrative. So to deconstruct this and to be able to come to this and say, OK, you know what? There will be no equality in the United States of America. And the, the black people or the Latinos are not going to be treated equally if we don't take seriously the narrative which we are looking at ourselves, which was exactly, by the way, because many people now are very, very quick to celebrate Dr. Martin Luther King. But what he said was very critical about what is happening now. He was very critical with power. At the end of the day, he came close to saying, we're not going to make it like this. We're going to fight. It's a fight. Because this integrative process is fighting doesn't mean violent fight fight is we know that it's going to be resisting to the dominant narrative. And this is an intellectual resistance. Intellectual resistance doesn't mean violence, but it means fighting, resisting, being courageous, facing power, facing who now is deciding. Because willing it or not, you may like or not Trump, but what he's saying is nurturing a specific narrat narrative. And what he said about what happened here in this country by blaming both, I think it was, they were equally responsible of what is happening was just outrageous. Now, this is something which is important, and you see how much in this, all of us here, we are part of the solution and part of the problem. It depends where we sit on this. Are we going to put ourselves behind the saying, oh, rule of law are working and, and this is it, or are we checking our own perception of our society and in which way we enter into this collective psychology? Because ethics has also to do with this, morality has to do with that uh, in, a, in a clear way and, and to deal with the majority narrative. Now, this is, these are things that when it comes to, at the, at, at the social level, when we speak about class, when we speak about gender, when we speak about ethnicity, when we speak about the religious participation into the social society, and when we speak now about the, the, the uh, majority narrative and the way we are talking about we, and it's always something which has to be checked, who are you referring to when you say we? That's something that you need maybe also to think about it in, in the way you speak about you and the, spe you spe the, the way you speak about we. These are things that we have at the social level. Now let me come, and this is the second part of, of my talk, come to from the social requirements where we have to deal with this, when we have to, be, to put everything into context. And you can understand here, it's complex. And we have to have a comprehensive approach. And the comprehensive approach has to do with the social requirement, the legal requirement, the psychological dimension, and the psychological dimension, and the cultural dimension, because it has to do with our culture. At the end of the day, uh, uh, we also have to, to, to get a sense of what brings us together as uh, uh, having a common culture and a common narrative. Now, um, the second point is to go now a step further. Inductively, I want to go from the social construct to the human ideal. What should be our human ideal? So when I come to you and say, you know what, I'm coming from Switzerland. This is my nationality. I live in London. I'm a European by culture. I always presented myself as having multiple identities. Say, you know what, 
I'm Egyptian by memory, I'm a Swiss by nationality, I'm a European by culture, I'm a Muslim by religion, I'm a universalist by principle, that's fine. And I am a man, because it's also part of my identity. <coughs> Multiple identity, that's fine. Now, I'm saying this why, because what I want to get out of this is to say, how am I going to articulate my belonging to a specific society to my belonging to humanity. What if, at the end of the day, the current atmosphere is pushing me to be part of a specific society at the price of my humanity? What if this happens? What if it could happen without me being aware of that? And the problem is that it's happening and we're not aware of that. Or if we are aware of that, it's just for the time or a specific period of time when we are watching TV, listening to what is happening around the world, and that's it. But our humanity is in danger when we accept what is happening today and we don't get it right. When it comes to what was said about our moral equality, the fact that, as I said, coming from the Enlightenment, what we had is that we are all equal, coming back to Aristotle, coming back to Plato, coming back to the very long Western philosophy, or Western tradition, and coming back to the religious uh, uh, teachings, Judaism, Christianity, and uh, uh, Islam, we agree on, on this. Uh, what should be part of our way of dealing with this is our common rationality. It takes effort and rationality to be able to say, okay, look, whatever is happening in my society, whatever is done to human being in my society and beyond my society at the international level, there is something that I'm not going to act to compromise on, which is our equal dignity as human beings. No compromise, no way just to accept that there are different treatments and this could happen. We don't agree with it and we should not agree with it within our society, but we should not accept it outside our society. So all this business, democracy for us and whatever could happen for the others, that's not going to work. And even in our name as Democrats, we accept to deal with dictatorships, that's not going to work. If us here, we speak about common uh, 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 equal rights and accepting that elsewhere people are treated with no rights and no humanity, there is a problem, an ethical problem, and it's a distortion of our meaning, our understanding of equality. At the end, we are coming back to something which was the very old Greek understanding, democracy for us, whatever could happen for them. Who is this them? the people who are less human than us, less civilized than us, less worthy of equality than us. We were very critical about what happened in, in Athens. Can't we just look at what is happening now in the way we are dealing with equality and justice as a moral requirement? So let me come to this. Uh, when it comes to what is happening today, what are you facing in, in, what are we facing in our societies now? It's the race of what we call populism. What is populism? Populism is four features, mainly. Just to get a sense of how do we deal with populism today. Populism is mainly emotional politics. Politics driven by emotion. So it's, uh, uh, it could be big data to be used, but it's also the media, it's also based on fear, on the sense of belonging, based on your emotion, be yourself against them. So emotional politics is less ideology, less rationality, and more emotions and immediate reactions. Which, by the way, it's what happened in this country with your last elections and over a very long period of time here and elsewhere. But that's the reality, populism. This is the first feature, emotional politics, driven by emotion. And what I said about equality is that it has to be rational. Wisdom is based on this, and this wise approach towards equality is 
it has to be rational. We have to think about it because it takes effort. It's not easy. You have to decenter yourself from where you are to understand the rights of the others, where they are. Proportional equality and justice has to do with you putting things into context. It couldn't be emotional <coughs> politics. It couldn't be like this. The second feature uh, that you have is this binary understanding, polarized perception of the world, us versus them. Us versus them. I told you, if you want to speak seriously about equality, you have to define who is this we. Emotional politics is us versus them. So we are going to be better ourselves if we know who we are not. So it could be we are not the black, we are not the poor, we are not the Muslims. It's all about this. It's to create this sense of fear emotional politics based on a binary vision of the world. The third feature is simplistic answers to complex questions. So we have an employment, it's you, foreigners. It's you coming to take our jobs. If we have a problem around the world, if we are the, vic we are the victims, it's because of you. Simplistic answer based on this binary vision of the world to complex issues. Unemployment is much more difficult than this. It's not enough to just to, to, just to uh, 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 remove the foreigners or to deal with you know, this uh, xenophobic uh, uh, statement. The problem here is very simplistic answers to complex questions based on our belonging and our fear. And the fourth characteristic, the fourth characteristic of uh, the populist ideology or way of looking at it is the victim mentality. The victim mentality means we are the victims of these potential people who are now taking over. They are going to Islamize the United States of America. They are, the black people are everywhere. So we are the victims. And this is exactly what Bush said just after 2001. We are the victim of these people who don't like our values. So this rhetoric of being the victim, not dealing with our responsibility, of course we have to condemn what happened, of course terrorist attacks has to be, have to be condemned, but to position ourselves every time something is happening to I'm the victim and welcome to the world of victims now. It's as if there is no, no one is responsible of anything. We are all victims. So these four features are there, and it's driven by emotion, driven by this polarization, by simplistic answer, and by nurturing victim mentality. And this victimhood and, 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 and sim simplistic positioning that we have uh, it's completely perverting anything which has to do with politics, with rights, with rationality. It's the way in we deal. It's very difficult here to uh, uh, deal with, uh, with, uh, with uh, the reality of social justice in this society when it comes to this. So there is no space for rationality, the way we have to deal with equality, and we are defining ourselves against the other. So in this emotional politics. It's the rights and equality for us versus them because they are the threat. They are threatening our societies and we end up acknowledging and accepting even different treatments towards them because they are potential threats and potential people who are not part of us. So we are reducing this we, reducing this collective uh, 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 project that we have by differentiating the people. So this is something that has, is happening at uh, the national level and then it has a, 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 an immediate impact at the international level. To the point that some of our fellow human beings are dehumanized in the name of emotional politics. In the name of we are the victims of these people. And how does it work here? when it comes to this is uh, to look at what is happening in, in, uh, around the world and uh, at the end emotional politics is ending up saying you know what America first France first Germany first us 
Why? Because we are in danger. It's us versus these people who are coming. And then at the end, the way you are defining yourself as human beings having equal rights within, it's dehumanizing the people outside to the point that today our citizenship is taking over our, about, uh, our humanity. When it comes, for example, look at what is happening now. What is happening now, you are watching TV. When new people are killed, it's unacceptable. When their people are killed, we have to deal with it and they have to deal with it. There is something which is selective reaction to the people who are dying, which is something which is international and structured races through the media coverage. That when today the refugees or the migrants are dying in the Mediterranean Sea, and we look at this, and we don't get that their humanity is as important than ours. Then, for example, you know, I was, for example, dealing with what happened in, in France about uh, the terrorist attack. And I was asked, you have to say, I am Charlie, I'm Paris. I said, sorry, sorry. I don't have a problem being Paris. I have a problem being Charlie. Because I don't, I don't like their sense of humor. I don't have a problem being Paris, but please, when you say I'm Paris, add I'm Damascus, I'm Baghdad, I'm Beirut, I'm New York, I'm all these countries, all these cities, not to differentiate between our people, it's just outrageous when they are killing us, and it's normal when they are killed there. This is something which is essential because our reaction to terrorist attacks and violence is just showing how unequal we are in the way we are treating human beings and life. So our emotional reactions are revealing the fact that we don't value life the same way. Their life is less valuable than others and ours. And it's exactly the same when it comes to refugees, when it comes to people who are leaving their country. They are trying to survive and we are criminalizing them. They are criminalized, and they are less, and, and, and once again, oppression is all about dehumanization of the other. For, have been, you know, I have been supporting and, and struggling for, you know, uh, against apartheid in, in, in South Africa, and in the same in Myanmar, supporting Aung San Suu Kyi, just to get her now saying that these people are all terrorists and they are threatening the Peace in the, in, in the, say, what's that? We were supporting you in the name of human dignity and what you are saying is exactly the same as uh, uh, the world's dictators were, were saying about the other, that they are not human beings, that they are terrorists. So in the name of this war on terror, in the name of this otherness, we are now accepting something which is an equal treatment within humanity. I'm finishing. So uh, that's, I think, it's, it's essential. And to do this, to come to this discussion here, there is something which is missing in our understanding of uh, 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 this discussion. And this is where I'm saying it's important to go from social discussion, or the social requirement, and then to this understanding of our common humanity, something which is now not there. Unfortunately, too often in our universities, in our societies, we are cutting ourselves from philosophy, spirituality, and the meta-narrative. How do we speak about humanity? If we are not seriously equipped in a rational way about our common humanity beyond our emotional politics, we are going to go the wrong direction. This is what is happening now. It's to be critically equipped with this sense of, I belong to humanity and never ever my citizenship will take over my humanity and my common belonging to human beings. Never. Never on earth to be an American will be more important than to be a human being. And if, the, in, in, if in the name of my Americanness, 
I'm able to forget my humanity, that's the starting point of complete inequality around the world. To the point that what we are witnessing now, so this meta-narrative, it's important when it comes to uh, uh, dealing with this, and Habermas was right when he was saying, we do not have metaphysics or religious discourse or something which is an overall understanding or a meta-narrative that is helping us to come with something which is a parameter. But still I think that we have to come back to this. And this is where I think that within our pluralistic societies, instead of accepting one another at the periphery of our differences, we need to come to philosophical <coughs> and spiritual uh, discussion about what makes us human beings. So to come to the center, not to speak about the periphery. There is a lack of, uh, we are dealing once again in a very simplistic way with our differences and our differences should bring us to what I think is essential and I think it's the contribution that we have to make as citizens is to come to uh, this discussion about uh, uh, what is at the end of the day, what is your philosophy of life? How do you deal with this humanity? How are you going to, to tackle racism in this country? Not just by saying an American or an Gentry. What is your reference point? What is your view, your, 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 uh, uh, your world view? And the way you deal with humanity, this has to be also a discussion which is essential. My, uh, my conclusion here is three things. The first one is exactly this one, which I, 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 I repeat. I'm very much, you know, when, when I'm dealing with the notion of identity and all this identity politics that we have, my main concern when it comes to identity, it's, it's this, link with the meta-narrative, with the philosophical positioning, with this worldview. What I'm expecting from atheists, agnostics, Buddhists, Hindus, Jews, Christians, Muslims, whoever, don't just come to me as my fellow citizen. Tell me something about your worldview. Tell me something about your values. Tell me something about the way your values are going to help you to be an active citizen dealing and promoting equal rights for all. So the big picture, not just to be an activist who is agitated, but an activist who has a vision. A philosophical way of dealing with this. If we are not struggling with this, it's very quick to be emotionally driven in our social life. This is what I meant by uh, dealing with this. The second point has to do with uh, uh, to get it right, that when you speak about equality, it's not enough to sit down and to say, let us be equal. We have to deal with power. Who has power? Who is deciding? Who is putting and setting the narrative? So we have to be critical, and it's an ongoing process of uh, this discussion about uh, uh, the, 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 the relationship. And it's on not only social, it's political, it's economic. It's economic. It has to do with the economic realities in this country. Because in the United States of America or in any industrialized society, the economic factors are promoting a specific narrative about who has power in this country. It's not by accident that the black people are the poorest within the inner cities. It's not by accident that they are not making the dominant narrative. Of course not, as I, I was saying. And then the, the, the last thing which is important for me, coming here and talking to you, coming to a, a university, dealing with, I have two concerns. The first one is always to reconnect university and cities. I don't want to think far from the society. I think that what we are doing in academia should serve the society we are living in. This connection is essential. But there is a second point here, which is who now should be the more equipped to resist emotional politics, to resist populism, to resist this uh, perception of the world where we as rich people, white people, we think for the world and, and we think far from the people. I think that if the students, if the faculty are not involved in this discussion without our society, if they are not promoting this rationality, this rational wisdom, this resistance to emotional politics, that's the problem. And it has to be done together. So this is my call at the end of the day. The we that I'm talking about, it's we. 
people of reason, wisdom, with your religion or without, but with something which is no compromise on anything which has to do with equality and justice for all, not only Americans. Not, it's not America first. It's not let America be great again. Let, you, let humanity be great again. Humanity meaning our human rights and our equal dignity. Thank you. of questions um, and I will um, let you if you see someone Dr. Ramadan any questions out there we got one right here uh, thank you very much I'm Brian Alexander professor of politics here at Washington and Lee um, so taking your, your, your point of a, a, a global notion of we and a global notion of, of dignity and pluralism um, we're in the American South we're in Virginia we're at Washington Lee University. How, how does one, I'm asking your, your perspective on, how does one move forward with, with the idea um, that, that, that you're suggesting that we have a, a, a pluralistic notion of we? Um, we see structural inequity, we see the challenge of, 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 of looking at narratives of the past, inequities of the past, inequities of the present, and reconciling them. With, with who we are today and, and reconciling them with the idea uh, that you're putting forward. Um, it's almost a practical question, asking for a global view. Where and how does one take what you're suggesting in, in terms of opening up this we to include all of us? How do you see that translating into sort of a practical politics? Um, do you see this sort of pluralism on the rise? Wayne, and if it's on, if it's where it's successful, what are the lessons that we, in our parochial American context, uh, could move forward with that? Shall I respond straight away? Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you for this question and this the practical uh, side of it because this is it's not easy, and yet I think that it's important to be very practical in the way we are dealing with this. You know, equality is a principle, justice is a principle. How are you going to translate this and deal within a pluralistic society with the complexity of it? And I have been advocating something that I can see on the ground, which is already happening, and in some uh, uh, region it works well. I think that we should not sit down and hope for a national movement coming from the top and being top down. My take on this is national movement of local initiatives. This is why we have to work together at the local level and to try to understand that the we should be created at the local level with people coming from different backgrounds. But with something which is very important, listen to the way the people are perceiving the reality, taking into account and taking seriously memories and history, when the black people in this country are telling you, you can't just deal with us without taking into account the history of this country, they are right. What they also have to understand, some of them, is that you cannot just be stuck in repeating the past and putting yourself in the victim of what is happening. No, of course, there is the past, there is something that is happening now, and there are structural racism and structural injustices. So you need to come with, with this understanding, listen to one another, to work on this, and then to start building on, on what is happening now. So the local uh, initiatives have to do with uh, equal citizenship, it has to do with really facing the reality of injustices in the way the people are treated at the local level, uh, uh, mistrust. You know, we need a revolution of trust. There is a great deal of mistrust in this society. A mistrust towards the people who are perceived as the newcomers, or black and white people, or Latinos. There is a great deal of mistrust. So how do you do this? It's, it's really by being involved. So there is something which is very simple in our daily life, which is kindness and openness, but it's not enough. 
because we have to deal with law, we have to deal with power struggle, we have to come together. So at the local level, this kind of communication and pluralism in action, I don't I'm not happy at all with anything which has to do with passive coexistence or peaceful coexistence. I want active coexistence. Come some with some solidarity and, and, and just projects within the society where we have to come together. And this is possible. Some people are doing the job. Unfortunately, the media are talking about what is going wrong. They are not interested in what is going right and being done. But I think that this is why we have to be active, every one of us. And to start the process is very simple. This is the way I started the book, The Quest for Meaning, is get out of your comfort zone. Don't be open in a closed world. In your people, say, oh, I am open-minded with my people. So that's the, the wrong way of putting it. So just to, to, to take the risk of encountering and building and, and being involved, we need really active citizens. We cannot just blame Trump and, and the leaders for who they are, while we are so passive and not taking seriously our values of equality and justice. Here. Thank you for your talk, Professor Ramadan. Um, my question has to do with equal legal rights, which you mentioned are necessary but not sufficient for social justice. And in particular, I want to ask about rights for lesbians and gay men. And um, I noticed in what I believe that you mentioned that you respect gay men and lesbians, but that you believe their lives don't comport with the divine project. And I wonder if you would support legal same-sex marriage and the adoption of children by same-sex couples. Straight to the, <laughs> <laughs> to the question and to the point. Look. Within the society, within a pluralistic society, and I think that this has to be acknowledged by everybody, you have your moral judgment and your understanding of what you think is right and wrong on a moral, on a moral, uh, uh, as a moral reference. So in the monotheistic tradition, homosexuality in the Christian, in the Jewish, in the Muslim tradition is not perceived as something which is the, the, the divine project, as I was saying in what I believe, which is uh, uh, that's not the way the believers are looking at the reality of uh, uh, um, human life. Having said this, this is a position that you can have between you and God and you and yourself. When it comes to the, so the society and in a pluralistic society, you can't by no way impose this understanding. No one can ask me to say everything is fine and it's right. No, I may think that it's not. Now, am I going to use my position by condemning all the people and not uh, uh, accepting that they are part of the society? It cannot be the case. The starting point of mutual respect is for me to respect that you think it's right and for you to respect that from my religious viewpoint, I think that this is not the right way to behave. What is important is do we agree, you and me or whoever, that the position of principle is to respect the people in their choice and in their way of life. That's my position. I respect who you are. I may disagree with the way you deal with your life. That's the starting point of a pluralistic society. What does it, when it comes to supporting uh, uh, the rights for, for example, marriage, from a religious viewpoint, a marriage is something which has to do with God. If you think that God doesn't like it, it will be very contradictory to say, I know God doesn't like it, and I think that God doesn't like it, I'm going to support it. But if you don't support it as such, if now there is a collective or a majority process saying that this is to be the way the legal framework is going to acknowledge the fact that you can marry, you have to respect the decision of the majority. So the decision of the majority should not impose on you to behave against your conscience. You cannot impose on anybody what you believe but nobody should impose unto you to believe the way 
uh, uh, the majority is believing in. So there is here the legal framework helping or letting the people do what they want to do, and there is your personal uh, understanding of what is right morally and what is wrong, and we should keep this. Because if, at the end of the day, our way of dealing with pluralism is imposing onto the people, there is only one way to be pluralist or to accept pluralism within a pluralistic society is going to be very difficult. Because there are lots of people, Jews, Christians, Muslims, Buddhists, even, you know, the Dalai Lama that, uh, that I was uh, uh, with, in his perception of, of this reality of homosexuality, he wouldn't support this. But what he's saying is that that's your way, it's not mine. So within a society, a pluralist system, based on rule of law, what is the parameter is mutual respect for all, respecting who the people are, and now respecting what the legal framework is, uh, is uh, protecting in the way you have to deal with it. But don't ask the people to go against their conscience because that's not going to work in a pluralistic society. So, so this is why I stand on this. It's, it's, there is no imposition and no condemnation, but there is a, a moral position which is, this is my way, this is the way I think, and I respect who you are and the way you think. Okay, I think we have time for one more question, maybe over on that side, yeah. I took too much time, that's no. I took too, I'm very sorry. I thought it was 45 minutes. Thank you so much for your time. I'm curious if you could tease apart the difference between uh, emotional response and rationality. Because uh, you, you tend to say, you know, we should, we should be rational, uh, but not emotional. Because uh, to me, human experience is inherently emotional. And I think philosophy has sort of given it a bad name and sort of been stigmatizing it. Uh, so if we are to sort of reach out to the general public in terms of accepting this global we, uh, shouldn't we actually start with the emotions, perhaps instead of sanitizing this notion of rationality? So I'm curious if you could tease those concepts apart for me. Uh, mainly, what is the difference between rationality to you versus what would you consider an emotional reaction? Is it unregulated emotional reaction or is it informed regulated emotions? Thank you. Yes, that, so th this could be another lecture about the relationship between <laughs> rationality and emotions. And, and by the way, this is one, I, I located one chapter dealing with rationality and emotion and spirituality as well in the book, The Quest for Meaning. Uh, but what I'm, I'm referring to when I'm speaking about emotional politics is the way you are driven by uh, immediate response to the way people are dealing with your fear and your identity. So it's negative definition of identity. I'm myself because I'm not you. And then emotions are really mainly based on nurturing a sense of belonging based on uh, uh, fear of the other. So it's about otherness, binary, and this. Now, when it comes to our daily life, and uh, I would be the last one to uh, underestimate the very importance of, uh, of emotion. I still think that uh, uh, in our spiritual journey, if I speak about spiritual journey, it's very important to really nurture our emotions but not be the, the subject or the object of our, our emotion and still being the subject of our emotion. And the subject of our emotion is this relationship between uh, rationality and emotion. And uh, you know what was uh, promoted by psychologists when they were talking about uh, uh, emotional intelligence, which is very close to what the mystics were saying about everything is good about emotion, the sense of you know, beauty, the sense of all this, it's important. Now be careful, the enlightened dimension of emotion could be very, very uh, 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 alienating. So you can liberate yourself and, and, and experience something which is close to the spiritual elevation, but it could be also alienation when the people know exactly how to deal with your emotion. We know now how your br the brain is working. We know how the stimulus could be and how we can capture your attention, capture your reaction. You have psychologists working in Hollywood, knowing exactly how, how we can just touch your emotions and bring you. 
So this is something which is very dangerous. It's exactly what ad advertisement is all about this. So I would say that uh, uh, I don't want to reduce emotions to this. And I think you are right. On this, we need something which is a more uh, uh, articulated discourse on this. I was just talking about the way our emotions can be instrumentalized by politicians or by, uh, you know, the, the, the entertainment industry in the way that we are losing our sense of our discernment, our way of assessing things, uh, because it's all based on fear. It's not based on knowledge. It's based on immediate reactions. This is what I was just referring to this. But on philosophical, in philosophical terms, what you are saying is critical. And, and, and we need to get it in another way. I would, I would rather promote something which is how do we deal with emotions in a way, and, 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 and not to have a very simplistic distinction between rationality and emotion, because there is no rationality without emotion and no emotions without rationality, by the way. Uh, sometimes it could have, when it's instrumentalized, it's just to take out from our uh, uh, emotions without our rationality, without our capacity of uh, discernment and judgment in things. But I, I, I agree with you. So. So that's good that you are saying this. I don't want to reduce this to that. But it's clear for me that what I am seeing day in and day out now was this populist uh, uh, discourse and this reaction. And the means, the means that we have, we have you know, the social networks and, 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 and all what is happening, the internet culture, it's very much based on emotional culture. Really, it's, 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 and it's worrying because uh, it's less knowledge and more reactions, or more immediate, spontaneous reactions. And that's very, very disturbing. Okay, on that note, please join me in thanking Dr. Ramadan. Thank you.